Good morning. That was awesome. Love me some good Trinitarian worship. I like it. Amen and amen. Some doctrine up in here. Excited. So my wife and I, uh, I asked her if I could tell this story. She's also conveniently not here today. Um, my wife and I have an annual or semi-annual fight, um, much like the Super Bowl in that regard. Um, and, and basically it's around a road trip that we, that we take, uh, usually for Christmas or for Thanksgiving, and the amount of things that we have to take with us. So we have, we have a, an infant and, and a toddler, so many things have to come with us, but there's also like groceries that come and usually Christmas gifts. And so there's always a fight. There's always this, this uh, disagreement that takes place. And this fight will continue. And usually we ride in silence until about Gainesville uh, on our way to Kansas about how much stuff we're bringing with us. She thinks we should bring more. And I am very decisively in the category of we don't need that much. Yeah. And what I've realized is that there's this, this, there's, uh, the reason why we have this fight is because there's values that are at war with one another. And one of the things that I value, I'm not going to speak for my wife here, but one of the things that I value is, is essentially traveling light. I like for things not to be complicated. I will sacrifice a great deal, much to my shame, for a lack of complication, simplicity, something just to go smoothly and easily. I will sacrifice a lot for that, I think. And what I realized is, I think a lot of people want things to be easy and simple. simple. And, and again, my wife and I often talk about whether or not we're overcomplicating something. We're making this harder than it needs to be. And I think this idea kind of trickles in to a lot of different areas of our life. Things always kind of feel like, is this really supposed to be, like going to the grocery store, does it really need to be this hard? And the answer is no, you can now have it delivered to your house. So it's great. But I think even in our Christian faith, we can make things harder than they need to be. Now, I'll be the first person, obviously, you just heard me, tell you that doctrine and theology and getting into the finer points of what we believe and understand is, is good, and in some ways, it's critical. Like, we need to really understand what we believe. But at the same time, it can become so overcomplicated and so difficult that we almost feel like I feel driving down the road uh, uh, with this car packed full of stuff, and I can't move. I'm like, uh you feel trapped and you feel like you're going to say something wrong and you feel like you don't really know what you believe and you, you, you're not really able to articulate it. And so we're walking through this series called This Jesus and how we get confused and we, we sometimes put that Jesus, the, the, the Jesus that we like or the Jesus that approves of everything we do or, or the Jesus that's a, that's a political ally or whatever, and we put him over and against this Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture, and so this week we're talking about this Jesus who was crucified. And what I want to do is I want to kind of simplify our faith. Not because, again, the finer points aren't important. They are. But I want to give you today uh, five basic things that you can run to about this Jesus that will tell you who this Jesus is. So when you're in conversation with somebody else and somebody says, who do you think Jesus is? You're able to kind of say five things. We're going to simplify. We're going to, I want you to be able to put everything you need to talk about Jesus in basically an overnight bag or a carry-on, okay? So that's what we're going to do today. We're in Acts chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 22. We're in the back half of Peter's sermon. This is kind of the first sermon of the church. And the first thing I want you to see is that this Jesus was unjustly killed. He was unjustly killed. Now we're picking up in the middle of Peter's sermon. And the reason why we're picking up is because the, the first half of this is a, an explanation of what's going on at the time. So the church is meeting together. Jesus has been crucified. He's been buried. He's been resurrected. And he has ascended. Jesus is no longer on earth at this point. And the church is getting together and praying because that's what God, Jesus told him to do. He says, wait in Jerusalem until I send the Spirit. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts speaking in a language that they shouldn't know. People will start speaking this way and this way and this way. And it spills out from their meeting place, and they wind up in a public area. <clears throat> and somebody asks, what in the world is going on? You bunch of uneducated people are speaking my language, and you shouldn't be able to do that. They say, have you guys been drinking? And Peter's response is not super spiritual. He's like, nah, it's only nine in the morning. <laughs> if it was later, that'd be a valid critique. But right now, no, no, we're not. He's saying, no, 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 what's happened is the promise that was made in Joel by the prophet Joel that God would pour out his spirit and people would dream dreams and prophesy and, and, and have visions, this is actually happening now. So that's the first half of Peter's sermon. 
But the second half is him anticipating a question. And the question is, okay, so if the Spirit's been poured out, what has happened? What event has taken place? What new thing has happened in history that God has all of a sudden decided to give the Holy Spirit to people now? And Peter's response is, Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, resurrected, and he is ascended. And so he begins to talk about this Jesus, and we'll pick it up in verse 22. And the first thing he says is, this Jesus is a real historical person. So this is the first of the five things I want you to know. Jesus was a real historical person. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. It doesn't say Jesus the Christ, which is the Greek way of saying Jesus the Messiah. He doesn't say Jesus, son of God, although that's what he is. He says Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus from Nazareth, the, the podunk town way up north that probably some of you all heard about. Jesus was from a real place. He really existed. Now, there are not very many scholars today. It's a very small minority who would say that, Jesus, that, that somebody named Jesus didn't exist in first century Palestine. Most people, whether they're liberal, conservative, evangelical, atheist, most scholars say, yeah, there probably was a literal Jesus who, who spoke and taught and preached and, and got a following of some kind. It's a real historical fact. There's a guy named Josephus, which is a great name. If you're looking for any son's names, there you go, Josephus. You just call him Joe for short, it works. Josephus was a Jewish writer who wrote about uh, the wars between Rome and the Jewish rebellion in the first century AD. And he talks about Jesus. He's not a Christian. There's a guy named Tacitus, who's a Roman historian. He talks about a guy named Christus, who has a following from Palestine. That's Jesus. People that were not believers talked about him. And so Peter goes on and says, not only does this man exist, but he was historically significant. He's important. Look what he says in verse 22. A man attested to you or made significant to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Peter's saying that, that this Jesus from Nazareth did miracles. He did mighty works. And every time, most of the time, when God does something new, he accompanies it with miracles or signs. When Moses comes to deliver the, Egyptian, or the Israelites from Egypt, what happens? The plagues. He does miracles. He does signs saying, nope, God is with me. Elijah, Elisha do miracles and signs to validate their ministry. Jesus does the same thing. Yes, Jesus loves people. Yes, Jesus wants to heal people. But he's also doing it as, uh, as evidence of who he is. And that's why he says they are signs. They are signs. They point to something greater. You stop at a stop sign, not because the stop sign itself has inherent power. It's because that means something. It's a symbol to all of us, a sign that there are legal ramifications if I just roll through the stop sign. In the same way, Jesus does miracles to point to something greater, that he is sent by God, that he is significant. And then it says these are marvels, these are wonders, which means that people saw them and their response, basically, uh, the vernacular is their jaw hit the floor. Never seen anything like that. This is incredible what Jesus is doing. And all this goes to prove for Peter and should have proven to his Jew Jewish audience that Jesus is at the very least a prophet with significant authority and power from God, at the very least. Like I said, this is one of the major reasons why Jesus does the miracles he does. Of course he loves people. Of course he wants to bring healing and restoration. But the, but the sign that the kingdom of God, this new movement of God in the world, is going to be brought forth is that these things are going to happen. Miracles, signs, wonders. People are going to be healed. Blind people are going to see. Lame people are going to walk. All this stuff is going to happen. The dead are going to be raised. All of this was prophesied to happen to show that he's the Messiah. He's the one that God has sent to bring in this new kingdom. In fact, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 4, he quotes Isaiah 61 which is a, a messianic uh, a prophecy, which means a prophecy about the Messiah. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in verse 21, he says, And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Peter says, Guess what? This prophecy y'all been looking for? It's here, and it's in me. 
Jesus proves he's God's chosen person to bring about the kingdom. So what happened? Well, despite this evidence, Jesus was killed. Look at verse 23. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This Jesus. Peter does two things right off the bat. The first thing he says is this Jesus, and this is the first this Jesus that we run into. This Jesus, the one from Nazareth, the guy that did miracles and signs, about a month and a half ago, you all killed him and put him on a cross. You saw him hanging there. Some of you even cried out for his blood and asked that your, the, the blood of Christ would be on your children and your children's children. Some of y'all did that. You killed him. And the second thing he says is, but don't worry, you didn't derail God's plan for the Messiah. In fact, it fulfilled God's plan for the Messiah. God intended that the Messiah would be rejected. He intended that the Messiah would die on behalf of the people. He makes it clear. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 53, which is one of the suffering servant prophecies. It says in 53, 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The only way for the Messiah to complete his mission and to bring in the kingdom is for him to die. Because Jesus' mission wasn't just to heal sick people and to cure physical illnesses. It was to cure a greater illness, the illness of sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve, this terminal thing that we have. We pass it on to our kids and our kids are going to pass it on to their kids. It's sin and brokenness and it's destructiveness. And the only way to fix that was for Jesus to die, and we'll explain why that is. But despite being a part of God's plan, human beings still killed Jesus. Look at 23 again. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. There were people, Jewish people, who using the Roman government as an accomplice executed Jesus. So you had religious leaders like me, I'm a religious leader, who were jealous and envious of the following that Jesus had, and they orchestrated an elaborate scheme to get him killed. He had moms and dads from a major city that probably attended Bible studies every week in their synagogue, crying out for him to be killed. He had keepers of the peace, soldiers, unquestioningly and brutally punish Jesus based on the orders of their superiors. He had political leaders like Pilate and Herod use Jesus as a political bargaining chip to gain favor with their constituency and to gain favor with one another. It even says, after this, Pilate and Herod had been enemies, but they became friends over the crucifixion of Jesus. You had somebody named Judas who was with Jesus, who got disillusioned with that Jesus, that G- the, with this Jesus, the Jesus that was proving it not to be the kind of Messiah he wanted. So Judas came up with that Jesus and tried to force his hand by betraying him, thinking he might do miracles, he might actually establish his kingdom, and he betrays him. I hope you see what I'm doing here. Jesus was not crucified by people that we would have thought of as our enemies. Jesus was crucified by the kind of people we go to dinner with. Jesus was crucified by our business partners. Jesus was crucified by our pastors and our politicians. He was crucified by our heroes. Jesus was crucified by the kid who sits next to you in class by the neighbor down the street, by your golf foursome, by the waiter or waitress that you're going to have to lunch today. Jesus was crucified by the person who's going to look at you in the mirror in the morning. John Stott, great English theologian, says, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something that is done by us. What's more, Jesus didn't deserve to die. He was crucified unjustly. He did not deserve what happened. He's the one person who's ever lived, who lived in a way that was totally loving and desired to do what was best for humanity. Now, they didn't always agree with what was best, but as their creator, he knew what was best for them. He's the one person who's ever lived who from start to finish wanted to do everything that God wanted him to do, and they killed him for it. You know what else? we would have done the exact same thing. We would have killed him too. He didn't deserve to die. He died unjustly. Everybody who has ever lived 
has lived under the curse of death because that's kind of the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. Everybody's been sentenced to death because we carry this sort of, like I said, genetic disorder, this sin nature. And it comes with a death sentence. But Jesus was sentenced to death. He didn't have a sin nature. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. And they killed him for it. They sentenced him to death. And we have been unjustly sentencing Jesus ever since. Like Pilate, we've accused him of being some kind of a tyrant or a dictator. Somebody wants to come into our life and be our king, but take away all our joy, take away all our fulfillment, take away all our fun. And that's not the kind of Jesus we want. We don't want to shape our life around that Jesus. So we sentence him. We sentence him to being a political pawn, a t-shirt slogan, an internet meme. We use him as, a, as an excuse to reject other people. We've sentenced him to public scorn by using his name as a blank check for apathy, self-care, personal comfort, personal gain. And as the writers of Hebrews 6 says, that eventually if you keep sentencing Jesus to all these other roles, if you keep going after that Jesus rather than this Jesus, you know what happens? You eventually reject the faith altogether because you're following after a Jesus that doesn't really exist. And he says that you subject Christ to crucifixion all over again. So what do you do? What happened? Is God going to allow injustice to stand? Of course not. If Jesus was unjustly crucified, he was justly raised. It cannot be understated how critical and important the resurrection is for Peter for the early church, and for the church today. If they can somehow prove at some point, sometime, at one time, whatever, that Jesus' body is still in the ground, let's just close up shop. Guess what? You got your Sunday morning back. You go to brunch because this is dead. It's done. The resurrection is critical because there were a lot of people in first century Palestine, Jewish men, who rose up and said, I'm the Messiah. I'm going to set us free from Rome. And they led a rebellion. And Rome does what Rome does best, put down rebellions. And they executed these men. And you know what these men did after they were executed? Nothing, because they were dead. Jesus, on the other hand, does what? He comes back to life. He comes back to life. And that's the third thing that you need to see, that, you know, kind of that overnight bag. The first one was that Jesus was a real person who did real miracles. Second one was that he was crucified. I skipped over that when he was crucified. Y'all got that, right? And the third one is that he's raised. He's resurrected. God overturns Jesus' unjust death by raising him. Look at 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This is kind of a strange metaphor, the pangs of death. Peter is is likening Jesus' resurrection from the grave to a woman in labor, which again, strange metaphor, but it works. If you have ever been in labor or you know someone who has, Once labor begins, that baby's coming out. There's nothing the woman can do to stop it. And if the baby doesn't come out, ultimately, it will kill the baby and the woman, right? I mean, again, I'm not a doctor, but that's the way I understand labor to be. It seems fairly inevitable once that process begins. Peter's analogy is here is like a woman in labor, death cannot hold on to Jesus. He does not belong in death, so it cannot hold on to him. And like a woman in labor cannot hold on to her infant. The grave gives way, gives birth to the resurrected Lord. These pangs. So why is death unable to hold on to Jesus? It's because he doesn't belong there. He's been unjustly sentenced. He doesn't deserve to die, just like we said. And since Jesus was imprisoned by death wrongly, God, like a court of appeals, comes in and is like, no, 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 human court sentenced you to death. You didn't deserve to die. So I'm overruling that, that conviction. I'm overruling that sentence. It wasn't right and sets him free. And this has huge implications for us, but it also has huge implications for Jesus. So let's talk about Jesus, because the resurrection proves something very critical about Jesus. It's that he's the Messiah. He already proved it with miracles. He didn't have to die to prove that, but it really cements that he's the Messiah in the Jewish mindset and in Peter's mindset. So what Peter does next is he takes Psalm 16, which is written by David, and he takes a section out of it and he says, there is no way that this applied to David. So I want us to talk about the, the quote that he makes, and then Peter does, a, uh, does me a huge favor. He explains the passage for you so I don't have to. 
Verse 25, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh also will dwell in hope. Now, this is important for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. Now Peter is not trying to prove through Psalm 16 that Jesus was resurrected. Most of the gospel writers don't try to prove that Jesus was resurrected because the proof is, I saw it. Their argument is, we saw it. These other 11 dudes saw it. Uh, These women over here saw it. And about 500 other people saw it. What he's trying to argue is that because of the resurrection, Jesus is the Messiah. He's saying that there is no way that David's talking about himself here. He has to be talking about somebody else. And the reason is because scripture tells us David David died. And he was buried. And you know what David did after that? Nothing. Because he was buried. Now, yes, I think he's with the Lord. I just mean like his body is still in the ground. And David knows this. David knows that he is not the person who is going to fulfill the promise that God made to him. Now, notice that that in in, uh, verse uh, 30, it says, Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. What he's saying there is God makes a promise to him, to David in 2 Samuel 7. It says one day there's going to be somebody who sits on your throne and they're going to stay there forever. And they're going to rule as a part of your lineage, a part of your, he's going to be one of your descendants, and he's going to rule forever and ever and ever. And David's not dumb. He knows, okay, I'm not scientific, but I do know that for somebody to reign forever and ever, they have to live forever and ever, right? They've got to beat death. So he's saying that you're not letting your holy one taste corruption. He's, not gonna, he's somehow going to defeat death. And so Peter's argument is it's very logical. If Jesus is back from the dead, he's fulfilling a prophecy that David made. And if David made that prophecy, then David was talking about the Messiah. So he's the Messiah. He's the one that God promised. And so because of this, there are implications for Jesus. If he's raised from the dead, not only is the Messiah, he's taken a new place. And this is the fourth thing we, the fourth thing we need to know. Not only is he raised, but he's also exalted. He's exalted. Look at verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified." This is the conclusion of Peter's sermon, where he ties together the the pouring out of the Holy Spirit with what he's just said about Jesus. And he's answering a question, an argument that people might have, because it says in the book of Joel that God is going to be the one who pours out the Holy Spirit. So why is Jesus the one that gets to pour out the Holy Spirit? Peter's answer is very simple. When he was crucified, when he was buried, and then he was resurrected, he ascended. He stayed with the disciples for 40 days, and then he ascends to heaven, which is where he is right now. And he's waiting to return to set all things right. But the word, the phrase, uh, at the right hand is an archaic term. We sometimes use it today. But if somebody in the ancient world was at your right hand, that meant they were invested with all of your authority, all of your power. If they spoke, it was on your behalf. So when Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, he has all the power of the Father. He has all the authority of the Father. And God is working. The Father is working. Almost like uh, he's he's an agent. Uh, Sorry, Jesus is an agent on behalf of the Father. And so while Trinitarianism, the idea that God was, is three, person, or three persons uh, with one substance is, is relatively new at this point, they're just now coming on it, Peter in the early church is getting the idea, this is probably not the first time that the Father is working through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this culminates in what John says about Jesus in his gospel in John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the... Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. 
And then Paul tells us in Colossians, all things were created by him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's talking about Jesus. See, the doctrine develops out of this idea that the Father and the Son and the Spirit love each other. They're the Godhead. They're persons as well. So Jesus is exalted. He's at the right hand. He is ruler. He is Lord. He is king. And he has all the power of the Father because he's fully God. So what happens? Well, um, he says, this Jesus that you guys crucified, this Jesus that's resurrected, this Jesus that has all the power of God, this Jesus who, like I said, we believe was, is God from the beginning. It's not that he was adopted. He didn't live right. And God was like, oh, you're cool. I'll, I'll take you on as my son. No, 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 no. The son of God has been before all things. And if you were like me, if you're sitting in that audience and you had realized, oh my goodness, we just killed God. You might be sitting there asking yourself, what have we done? What have we done? Because I'm pretty sure that most people, maybe not the religious leaders and maybe not Judas, but the average person that was crying out for Jesus' crucifixion probably thought they were doing the right thing. They probably thought he was a rebel. They probably thought he was causing trouble. They were listening to their religious leaders and they were like, okay, they know more than I do, so okay, yeah, kill him. But they might also be sitting there thinking as they're listening to this sermon of Peter's and being proven through miracles, through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and through the, the evidence of their own scriptures, I think we were wrong. And then they might reflect on what they did during Jesus' crucifixion. Maybe some of them watched him be beaten. Maybe some of them did cry out for him to be crucified. Maybe some of them walked by where he was being crucified and, and made fun of him. It's like, huh, look at that criminal. He totally deserves that. Oh, I remember hearing this guy. He used to say that he could rebuild the temple in three days. Why don't, you, why don't you just come on down from there if you can build the temple in three days? Surely you can get yourself off a wooden cross. And there's probably this sinking feeling to be shown so powerfully that you're wrong. And that actually you were responsible for the murder of the Messiah. And like I said, they unjustly sentenced him and we do the same thing. While Jesus, yes, loves us and desires to give us life, Jesus is also Lord. He is exalted. He's at the right hand of the Father. And most of us, myself included, act like Jesus sits at our right hand, not the right hand of the Father. He works for me. He's my personal assistant to make sure my dreams come true, my goals come true, everything that I've ever wanted becomes realized. And we need to wake up to the fact that Jesus does not work for us. He's at the right hand of the Father. Whoever this Jesus is to you, if he is not crucified, resurrected, and exalted, you are worshiping a false Jesus. You're worshiping a that Jesus. So what do we do? That's exactly the question they ask. This Jesus requires just one response. Just one response. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, we ask the same question. What do we do? Repent and be baptized. Repent, repent. What does it mean to repent? Repent's an old church word, but it means to change your mind. Now, you might think, okay, cool, Travis, you've changed my mind. I'm good to go. No. In the ancient world, to change your mind means to change your action, okay? Like, you can tell me that sugar is bad for me, but I will go home and eat an entire sleeve of Chewy Chips Ahoy cookies. You have maybe changed my mind. I know it's bad for me, but I also know it's really good. Have you changed my mind if you've not changed my action? No. God is calling you today to repent to change your mind and to change your action, to change what you believe about this Jesus. Peter's call and my call to you today is to get your life in line with this Jesus, the Jesus who's resurrected, who is the Lord. Every time we encounter the risen Christ, we are called to repentance, to confess and to repent. And for some of you, this may be the first time you've heard that. This is the first time you've heard and been put in the position of feeling like, wait, I'm, 
I'm responsible for Jesus' death. He lived like 2,000 years ago. Yeah, you are. And I am too. And maybe you've been trying to live your life under your own terms. You've been living uh, with, with maybe Jesus as a personal assistant or God as a personal assistant or some sense of spirituality, but not really religious. Maybe your faith, it can't be fit into an overnight bag because you don't really have one. Faith, not an overnight bag. And so today, there's a chance for you to change all that. Because God wants to do something, just like he does here in Acts. We'll, we'll read next week that 3,000 people, lives are changed because of what Peter says. And this can be you. You can be counted among that number. You can be somebody who inherits this great, great inheritance of being counted amongst the people who, yeah, we're on the wrong side of, of eternal history. We're opposed to Christ. But you can change that today by acknowledging, yeah, I have messed up. All of us are going to have to answer before God for, for something. We have to answer before the Lord because of what we've done with our lives. And you have two choices. You can appear before the Father and you can say, Lord, I was, I was a good guy a good girl, I did these things right, yeah, I made some mistakes. Or you can say, I don't really have anything to offer, but I'm believing that Jesus Christ offered everything I needed on the cross. He paid for everything I did wrong. So even if I'm a good person, bad person, it doesn't matter because I have Christ. And of those two, just logically thinking, let's not even talk about scripture, logically thinking, what do you think God is more likely to accept? the work and actions of his own son or somebody who on their best day probably isn't that good of a friend to God to begin with. Brothers and sisters, you have an opportunity today to turn to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, what do you need to do today? You need to repent. You need to give him your life. There's an opportunity to do that today. And if you have done that, if you, if you know you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, great, you do the same thing. Minus the baptism part. You've already hopefully been baptized. If you haven't been baptized and your faith is in Christ, you need to do exactly what that young man did. That, man call, that young man calls you out today if you've not been baptized. He is brave to do that because that is the way the church for 2,000 years have said, I want to be identified with Jesus. It doesn't save you, but it does tell the world that this is where I'm putting all my hope and trust is in Jesus Christ because I'm identifying with his burial, his resurrection. For the rest of us, we confess and repent. There are things in our life that are not under the lordship and leadership of Jesus Christ. We've got to bring it under. There's something that you're thinking of right now. And you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't have, that's not, that doesn't belong to the Lord. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your work week just this week. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's a relationship you're in. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a, a hobby that you're just addicted to. And we need to confess and repent. When you encounter the risen Lord, you fall to your knees like Paul did. And you say, Lord, forgive me. And you bring it under his lordship and his leadership. Now you might be sitting here today and say, okay, then what? Well, you go tell people about it. And, and, and that's why you need the carry-on bag. That's why you need the, the briefcase that you're going to take with you in your work day tomorrow. Because, and you might sit here and say, well, Travis, what you talked about is pretty complicated and pretty deep. Agreed. It's the gospel. Nothing's deeper. But I'm going to give you five, the five things. I'm going to repeat them for you so that you can know what they are. Jesus was a real person who lived, who did miracles, and he was crucified. He was raised because he was crucified unjustly, and God resurrected him, proving that he's the Messiah. He's the one who's coming to bring in the kingdom. He's now exalted at the right hand of God. And he's waiting to come back to set right all injustices. And until then, this is the fifth thing, I'm putting all my faith and hope and trust in him until I see him face to face. Maybe I say, well, Travis, that's still a lot of words. I'd be like, well, y'all need to get a better attention span. <laughs> Jesus lived. We killed him. God raised him. He's reigning. And I need to respond. What is your response today? The question has been asked by the very people who literally not figuratively, literally killed Jesus. Brothers, what do we do? Every single person in this room should be asking that very question, what do I do? Repent. 
change. Put your faith in him and do it every day. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you that the Messiah has come and that through your foreknowledge, through your understanding, through your wisdom, you knew what we would do. And so Lord, we are sorry that we rejected you. We're sorry that we reject you as Lord of our lives in different ways that we have set up a, a, a that Jesus who upholds and approves of our idols and the, the things we love, the things we want to do with our own life. We've created our own Jesus to rubber stamp them and make us feel good about ourselves. And Lord God, I pray that you would forgive us, that we would repent of that and that we would come to follow this Jesus, the one who lived, who died, who was raised, who's exalted, and who offers us the gift of new life. Lord, Holy Spirit, work today in our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.